Welcome into the Wednesday Bible Study. We uh, we come to you every Wednesday from the studios of the Rick and Bubba Show. Uh, I'm Rick Burgess. Uh, my day job is co-host of the Rick and Bubba Show. Find all the details about that at rickandbubba.com. But uh, we're here today to talk about uh, the Word of God. Uh, we're talking about uh, diving in uh, to study the Holy Word of God. We've been doing that here uh, coming up in September, I think is our 10th anniversary uh, here in the Rick and Bubba studios or the other Rick and Bubba studios prior to this one. Uh, and uh, what we do is a Bible study every week, walking through the Word of God. We've done some other books and commentaries from people as well. Uh, there's a variety of those we've done over the years. If you'd like to go find some of those archives, it's pretty simple. Uh, just go to themanchurch.com, themanchurch.com, click on Media, and you'll see the listen or, or, or the watch. You can do either one, either the video archives or just the audio archives. And you can go back through series that we've done in the past, other books of the Bible and, and other topics. They're all there. And you can also catch the archives of the study we're doing now. And that is our walk through the book of the Revelation, these, uh, these future events that we've been talking about as God has prepared us not only for what's coming in the future, but our application of what we should be looking for in our lives today. Uh, so we, be sure and, and, uh, and settle in. Turn to the Revelation chapter 17. The Revelation chapter 17 is where we'll be today. We're not going to go very far. We're only going to go into six verses today, uh, but those six verses will be plenty uh, for us to discuss in the hour that we have together. You heard me mention themanchurch.com. If, if you're not familiar with uh, with themanchurch.com. Uh, this is a men's discipleship strategy. It, it's a hub where you can go and find materials uh, as individual men uh, for you to grow spiritually, talking about devotionals and, and things of that nature. Uh, but also it's uh, our, our main focus is on the church and, and the communities all across the country that have a desire to reach and disciple men. Many times we may have that desire, but you can't find the, the tools or the resources to do it. To do it, So we felt called by God to, to provide those resources, and we do. We have multiple 40-week curricula available. Uh, we're working on our fifth now. Four are already there. Uh, and this would take you through an entire year of small groups uh, in your church or your community. So it's turnkey, uh, and those are available at themanchurch.com. We also uh, send out speakers and teachers uh, for the high challenge part of our, our strategy. It's high challenge followed by high equipping. The high challenge is when men gather together uh, in services designed for men or maybe events or, or whatever the case may be. And of course, and when we're doing that, uh, that's where the high challenge takes place. And we have speakers we send out. Here's some opportunities for this week. Uh, there's Benny Wink for you right there in front of the camera. Uh, if you're looking at this week, uh, it's good to see Benny. Uh, for those of you that wonder where he is, now you know. Uh, so coming up this week on Thursday, uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi, uh, Rich Wingo will be going out in the Shoba Baptist Center in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, this is an association of churches. They are now going into their third year of doing the strategy, which means they'll be starting our, a third curriculum, and uh, Rich Wingo will be there to uh, to challenge them and try to get more men into these churches that are doing our curriculum into the small groups. On Friday, Lord willing, because uh, I'm flying commercial, we'll see, uh, I'm headed to Austin, Texas. I'll be at City Reach Church in Austin, Texas. This is the first time that they're going to introduce uh, some of our small group curricula, and uh, they're going to be put, they, they bought two of them, and they're going to put men in different ones. I'll be there giving that message and challenging the men there in Austin, Texas, and hopefully finding time to eat some delicious barbecue. Uh, man Church coming Sunday night, August 6th, Startville, Mississippi. First Baptist Church, Startville, they're already doing the strategy. This is their next strategy, and you can get into a small group there. Scott Garoski will be doing the message in Startville, Mississippi. Uh, and then uh, coming up on the 19th of Mobile, I mean of August in Mobile, West Mobile Baptist Church, Tim Ashley will be there. Also on August 19th, Hickory Hill Baptist Church, Westville, Florida, Brian Gunn will be there. On the 20th of August, East Heflin Baptist Church, Heflin, Alabama, Todd Jones there, they're kicking it off. Indian Springs Baptist Church in Indian Springs, Alabama, about three minutes from my house, August 20th, I'll be there, they're kicking it off. And then uh, coming up in Flintville, Tennessee, Stewart's Chapel Baptist Church, we'll have Tony Cooper. Uh, speaking to them to get them started. And then coming up in uh, August 23rd to Scumbia, Alabama, Parkview Baptist Church. And then on the 31st of August, Lee Moore from Team Man Church at Calvary Baptist Church, Union City, Tennessee. 
and that's just the month of August. So uh, you can go to themanchurch.com. We get this a lot. Where can I get plugged into this strategy? If there's a man church happening, that would be a good indicator they're doing it, and you can plug in there. Let's open up in a word of prayer, and let's jump right into the Revelation chapter 17. Lord, thank you for today. I pray, Lord, that we hear the warnings from you. I pray, Lord, that we're not foolish, as you have told us, for us not to walk as the unwise, but to walk as the wise, uh, for the days that we live in are evil. Uh, And, Lord, help us to understand that all these things you told us we should be looking for are right before our very eyes. Uh, And as we see those, though we do not know the time or the hour, uh, we know that the time draws ever closer. Uh, And may we apply that to the life we're living now, Uh, so that we are not caught surprised by your return. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so here's what's happening. This is going to get not confusing, uh, but, you know, Karl Marx uh, once said, uh, the great communist, uh, and uh, he said that religion is the opium of the people. And you've heard this before, people who are not believers. Oh, religion, that's just a crutch that... You know, the weak have to lean on, and Karl Marx kind of had that point of view. Um, and but, but what he doesn't realize is this thing that he calls a weakness, it's actually a desire that was placed in us by our Creator. We, we were created to be worshipers. So every single human being, without exception, will eventually worship something. Okay, And most human beings are already worshiping something. The question is, are you worshiping the right thing? Everybody's worshiping, whether you want to believe it or not. It's, it's whether you're worshiping the right thing. Since the fall, the, the, that, that, that God-given desire for us to know God, that's given by God, our desire to know him. That's why you see Paul saying things like, really, no one has an excuse. God has clearly revealed himself to everyone. Even in creation, he's revealed himself. Dallas, good to see you again, buddy. Uh, Welcome back. So anyway, um, so this has been twisted because of the fall. Remember this. This is important to understand. So important for you guys to understand. God's design is clear, but once we fail, then Satan and his demons will always try to have a twisted version of what God intended. God intended music for worship. Satan twisted it into something else. So, so God has intended entertainment to be something that would glorify him. We've taken it and twisted it. Our desire for these things is from God, but how we actually fulfill that desire is always twisted by Satan. And that's why we need to be what? Regenerated. That's why we need to be born again. That's why Jesus, the life giver, has to start our life over. Nicodemus says, how am I going to enter my mother's womb? You're not going to enter your mother's womb. You have to spiritually be born again. I must come as God in in, in human flesh. I now am the life giver, and I've got to give you that new life back. If not, you're going to do all the things God designed you to do, but you're going to do them incorrectly. You're actually going to be blaspheming God instead of glorifying God. You're going to be worshiping idols instead of worshiping God. You're going to be taking intimacy between a man and a woman that God gave as a gift, and you're going to twist it, and you're going to corrupt it. All these things are from God, but Satan has a twisted version of everything. And you and I don't know the difference if we don't have the Holy Spirit. And so what what now is going to be happening as we get toward the, the end times um, we, 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 can, we have to understand that none of us can discern properly how to do anything in a God-honoring way if you have not been regenerated and you have not been redeemed by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you don't have Jesus, you have no hope. Satan is going to eat your lunch. You got no chance. And, and that you have no ability to even do what's right. And that's the reason why you see a different attitude from God and through the, the, the apostles in Scripture. Notice the different attitude when they're addressing people who don't know any better. When Jesus says to the woman that is about to be stoned, he said, I'm the only one that can forgive you, and I'm the one that can condemn you. And he says that he's not going to condemn her if she does what? Goes and sins no more. Repents. So that part's often left out. So so it, 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 this is 
this is the only hope we have. This is all getting corrected in one way and one way only, and that's through Jesus. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You'll never come back to the Father unless you come through me. Uh, if you want that clarity, it's got to be through Jesus. Uh, and so our love for sin has corrupted our ability to truly know and love God. If you have your Bible, uh, just flip back a little bit to Romans. And I promise I won't do a lot last week when I kept flipping past Jude. I actually got to the point, I, I told some of the guys afterwards, I said, I got to the point where I thought this Bible I'm using is so old that I forgot that way back when my, my kids ripped Jude out of here and I couldn't find it. But anyway, in, in, in Romans chapter 1, look what Paul says in verse 21. He says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. So so how did this happen? He says that they, of course we all know God exists. But even though we know God, if we're not regenerated by Jesus, the Apostle Paul is, is telling uh, uh, the, the church in Rome, he said, when you look outside and you see all the depravity out there, understand that even though these people know God, they don't honor God, they don't give thanks to God, because they become futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts are darkened. They have to have clarity again that only the Holy Spirit provides. If not, then we, we cannot overcome uh, this love that we have for sin. So remember... This is important. Now we're about to get into today's lesson, and buddy, does it apply to right now? I, I'm literally dealing with this topic today, okay? What the adversary knows is that you and I are made by God, that he knows very well. He believes in God. He knows that Jesus was the Son of God. He knows, the, he knows all this is completely true, and he knows we know it's true. But what he knows is God gave you the desire to worship, so I must make sure that you're worshiping the wrong thing. I can't stop you from worshiping. So what I've got to do is i got to come in and twist what kind of worshiping you'll do, and let me tell you one of the ways I'm going to do it. I'm going to get in that church. I'm going to start giving you terms like being spiritual. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to start having, having, having you take this attitude that saying things like, well, the God I worship wouldn't do blank, or the God I worship does this and he wouldn't do that. And I'm going to let you make your own version of God. And I'm going to bring in people that are going to just, you're going to love them. They're going to be great orators. They're going to look great. They're going to sound great. They're going to start giving a version of God that if you don't know his holy word and you haven't re be regenerated, you're going to think sounds pretty good to you. And the one thing I surely am going to make sure it happens as we get further to this false religion that's going to take over the world, we're certainly going to stop talking about sin. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that God has a standard. And, 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 uh, and a lot of us are in violation of that standard. No one wants to hear that. So sin, and before you know it, I'm going to make sure that these people that I control, not God, that they find their way into pulpits and they find their way on YouTube. and they find Now, with all the technology, I can take false teaching and I can run rampant with it. Rampant. I'm going to put out books that are going to look good on, and, uh, 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 and you're going to get in there and you're going to think, now is this a, is it, what, I, is, is this, this doesn't sound right. And then I'm going to jump in and say what I said to Adam and Eve. Oh no no no. You sure this is wrong? Is that what God really said? Look how many followers this person has. Look how many people love him. Look how big this church is. Look how many worship songs they put out. You can't question that. And if you do, people get mad at you. They think you're being mean. They think you're being self-righteous. They think you're being legalistic. Oh, I love that kind of stuff. See, I'm going to love if people will start calling obedience legalism. I hope I can get that done. He's done it. Y'all don't really know the difference between obedience and legalism. You'll call obedience legalism, and you'll, and you'll want no part of it. And you'll forget that Jesus said that those who love him actually obey him. 
and you'll start you start thinking he, you and I'm gonna make God unreasonable. That he just seems unreasonable the things he wants you to do. I'm gonna have things like sexual purity seem like that that's something that could never be accomplished. And how dare us even remotely consider trying to do it? And that God's okay with that. And I'm gonna take grace. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a blast with grace. I'm gonna let you. Enjoy grace, but I'm going to let you take it places it was never intended to be taken. I'm going to let you take grace to a point that you think you can do whatever you want to do and God's okay with it. And then I'm going to get into universalism, and that's going to be my favorite. Then I'm going to make sure that everybody thinks they're going to heaven. And I sure hope they think that. And that's exactly what is happening and what is only going to continue to happen until... False religion will dominate the fallen world, and it'll be no surprise that it's going to play a major role in end times. The false religion will unite the fallen world because it's a corruption of what we desire already. And you know what else we love? Not only do we desire it, man, if you could show me a supernatural bend, ooh, I just can't get enough of the supernatural. I, just show me some miracles and 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 let me see some some signs and wonders. Now I'm going to conveniently forget that Satan can do those too and not discern them properly. Uh, you know, I, if well, if it's supernatural, it must be from God. But see, don't ever forget that Lucifer was created by God as the highest ranking angel and was given supernatural powers, limited by God, but he certainly has them. I mean, if you just go to the, the story of Job, apparently, apparently, Satan can control the weather. Apparently. How does he kill all of Job's children? With a storm. So when you hear thunder and lightning, don't always assume that's from God. Anything, just because something's miraculous doesn't mean it's from God. And so that supernatural bend and the corruption of our God-given desire to worship is going to set the people up for a beautiful deception. I mean, a be- let me tell you something. I'm going to say this as loud and as clear as I possibly can. Listen to me. You cannot afford to continue to be lazy with your studying and applying and knowing the Word of God. If this is not at the center of your life, and you're going to continue to casually be biblically illiterate. Not just you will pay a price. Everybody connected to you is going to pay a price. you got to know what you're talking about. And you have to be able to say what that person just said isn't right. I'm, now, now, it's going to get worse, but I'm talking about where we are right now compared to where we've been now more than ever. It's rampant. Y- y'all wouldn't believe the things that people send me. And I mean, it'll have the most blatant part of it that is not right. I'm like, that's so blatant. Yeah, but look at all the other good stuff they say. But you can't ignore that. You can't let that go. And 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 you got to be able to say, does this pass the test of my biblical knowledge? But here's the bad thing. If you don't have any biblical knowledge, what are you going to compare it to? I hope you find somebody that knows what they're talking about. I told you the time. I mean, it, it, and I've told you this before, but I'm going to say it again because I, I know there's new people. Craig Kelly, he's now what he calls himself, a missionary in Northern California. Uh, but but uh, he's he's there as a pastor now, and he was here at the time. And he and I used to lunch on a regular basis. And he sat down with me, and he was one of the people discipling me early on when I first became a follower of Christ. And he said, today I'm going to tell you this. You better get serious about your knowledge of the Bible. He said, because if you're farming this out, if somebody else is teaching your children the Bible, and if somebody else is teaching your wife the Bible or shepherding her, other than you, whoever that is, is a better husband and father than you are. And I've never forgotten that statement. Never forgotten that statement. So 
when we get to the Revelation chapter 17, the spiritual nature of the Antichrist kingdom is going to be revealed. Now, keep in mind, we're going to today, we're going to concentrate. It's going to be made up of two things. There's going to be a religious system, which we're going to cover today. Next week, there will be a political system. And then as we go forward into 18, you're going to see that the political system of the Antichrist will overwhelm and completely consume the religious system. It's it's just going to eventually take, they're going to be blended to begin with, but the political system will eventually take that over. And that's where some of us in here, even in this country, be real careful not having your politics and your spiritual life, be careful not to marry those incorrectly. Look, we're in a free country. We have the right to vote. We have the right to, we have a constitution, and we're blessed to, to have, have those situations, and we should go out there, and our, our political views certainly can, can play a role, but you be real careful when you start letting that political view give passes to things that are blasphemy. When you start letting politics and getting ahead politically be more important than spiritual integrity, be real careful. Because that's where the end times is going. It's going to start out looking like there's a church and there's there and there's a political system and 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 and, and a religious system, but they're going to blend to where they're one in the same. Okay, so and 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 they're not one in the same. So now let me tell you the part that can be a little bit confusing, but stay with me. Don't worry. Your old friend Rick Burgess, the C student from Calhoun County, is here. So I'll explain this to where we can understand it. You see this read the revelation, you'll go chronological with the revelation, and then sometimes it'll stop, and it'll stop being chronological, and it'll just unpack something, and then it'll pick back up to moving forward in the, in the order of events. 17 and 18 of the, revelation, of the revelation, they're inserted in the chronological flow of the revelation, which will continue in 19. But 17 and 18, we're going to digress a little bit to look at God's specific judgment uh, and what is being judged. So these two chapters are going to go back to describe the world system led by Satan and the Antichrist, the false prophet. We're going to go back and look at him before recording its destruction. Everybody with me? So we're we're going back, and we're going to take a deeper look at the Antichrist and Satan and the world system they've set up and we're going to take a deeper look before it's destroyed at, uh, at this religious system and the false prophet. We're just going to look deeper into that for more detail, and then we'll see it completely be destroyed. We know it's already been destroyed. We saw the destruction of it with the seven bowls, but now we're going to go look at exactly what was destroyed. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? All my C students with me? Okay. So because for a minute you're going to be like, wait a minute, I thought we already destroyed all this. We have but we're going to go back and look at what was destroyed, okay? All right, so John um, uh, has heard of the of Babylon's destruction in, in, in 14, 8, and also 16, 19. Now the details of that destruction is going to be given to us in this vision. So during the tribulation, understand, and this is going to make a lot of sense to you, if you're still here during the tribulation, it's bad, bad, and real bad. So what happens when people are in situations that are bad, bad, and real bad? They start getting real spiritual, okay? So during that tribulation, people will desperately be seeking religion, and be careful with that word, because of what is happening to the world. People's gonna, they're, they're going to turn to the Antichrist, and the false prophet has already said he's the Savior, right? We know that's already happened. So if you're desperate and the false prophet who is going to be a person that has some sort of resume that makes him believable. I can give you a lot of people's opinion on that, but I know it will upset. Uh, just think to your in your mind how many, uh, how many religious figures do we have that claim to be God's mouthpiece? Um, there's only one, but, but anyway, and, and I don't know whether that's good, but, but I mean, you would look and go, if this person said this person's okay, a lot of people go, that's all I needed to hear. Now, there may be others that come that I don't know about in the future, and, and that turns out not to be the case. But, but what I'm saying is right now there's a false prophet of some kind that people trust that has said, you saw the miracle yourself, I, I endorse him. If you got trouble, come see him. 
and they're all going to flock to him. Uh, false prophets going to, and, and of course the de- deceptive demons are playing a role in that too. So Antichrist will establish a worldwide religion, uh, and of course we know what's going to happen here. Uh, the title of it's going to be Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. I'm going to use that word today. Other interpretations in English use other words that also mean the same thing that harlot means. Um, of the abominations of the earth. So we have we have been here before. Uh, human beings have done this before. Genesis 11, 1 through 9, Tower of Babel. Didn't take long uh, to us decide that we're going to create a worldwide, uh, worldwide religion uh, led by Nimrod, which, by the way, was one of Noah's grandsons. Thank you, Nimrod. God shuts that down. Jeremiah is lamenting about this Ishtar cult uh, that God's people are running to. And Jeremiah rebukes them in Jeremiah 44, 15 through 19. So this, this Babylonian worldwide uh, cult, its religion, false religion, has been an issue, uh, and, and Babylon's been at the center of false religion. Uh, the devil will return to Babylon to launch the final false worldwide religion. The new Babylon will do it again, and it will be depicted, and this is what God describes a false church. Fault, the false church, and God has told, said, called his people this throughout Scripture, is going to be represented as an unfaithful woman. A woman who cannot be trusted sexually because she's not pure. He calls his people that when they go after other gods. He can call his church that uh, when they've left uh, biblical scrutiny and now have become complete apostasy. So let's look at verse 1 and 17. Verse 1 and 17 Then one of the seven angels, these are the ones that were pouring out the bowls, who had the seven bowls, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute, is what mine says. Others says harlot. Some others in the King James Version even use another word that starts with a W, uh, who is seated on many waters. So, so, So first of all, we realize that the harlot prostitute uh, is is exposed by one of the seven angels, and and John connects uh, with this angel, and the angel says, "Hey, see what I'm pouring out on here, and it's the fall of Babylon. You want me to show show you what we're destroying and why we're destroying it?" And and John, you know, gets the yeah, let's let's see it. So he he he's looking at the final judgment, and and of course the harlot prostitute. That's always a metaphor for false religion, idolatry, apostasy. Uh, God called Nineveh this. He called Tyre this. He called uh, Jerusalem this when they were chasing after uh, false gods and going with pagan religions. Um, and, and, of course, the, the term prostitute, uh, harlot, and, and what this is representing, and, and, and I don't want to sugarcoat this, um, because don't make it any less than it is, and it might make you and me take this more serious in our own lives. When we dabble in spiritual apostasy, we are committing spiritual fornication. And God has made that clear. That's why he calls us that. That's why when we get to the end, and we'll see this, you'll see the pure bride. And that's the, that's the church that he acknowledges. That's the church that the bridegroom, the bridegroom comes for, you will notice that he refers to the church that will be in the new heaven and the new earth. He refers to that church that he raptures. He refers to that church as what? His bride. A stainless, spotless bride. Remember what that all, go, all goes back to? You know, it, 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 is, is, you know, there was a time that if, if your daughter was being given to a family in marriage, you, you provided them, and, and I won't get in great detail, with something that would prove that that woman entered into this relationship pure. And, and, and if the time came to consummate the marriage and, and, that, and, and she didn't pass the test, it was really bad. You, you, you see that analogy that, that God is showing us? I will not marry a bride that has committed spiritual fornication against me, the groom. So this is a very serious thing. And, uh, and so you, you see this. So the authority of the prostitute 
is shown by what? Look at look at the, uh, the this what, what he sees when he sees the harlot, when he sees the prostitute, she is seated on many waters. So what 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 is that telling us? And you probably can figure that out uh, without me telling you. But what this means is that there will be quite a bit of authority uh, that uh, the false church will have. It will be universal. All the kingdoms will be going. We're all on the same page on this one. This is our official world religion. Um, and uh, and the false religion is going to dominate all the unredeemed. The authority, as I said, will be universal, and all who are left will reject sound doctrine. They will reject the God of his holy revelation, and they will go after a false Savior, and they will worship a false God. Verses 2 and 3. With whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So we we see the kings of the earth. She's going to influence the highest offices and positions in the world. Now now notice notice she's presented as an unfaithful wife here because these are all unrepented people. And what you'll see is that one of the reasons this, the, that these unrepented people will go after this harlot is because they are drunk on what? Her immorality. Think about it. Have you ever thought about it? Look at the, all the, the cults and the paganism of the, of, of, of the scriptures. Look at the cults and the pagans that are accused to even be around today. What's one thing that's always prevalent? If you go to other countries... If you go to where they worship false gods, what seems to be the dominating thing about these false gods? Sex, orgies, temple prostitutes, defiling yourself, lewdness. And it says this will be so intriguing to the lost because they won't be able to believe that they've actually found a religion that allows them to be sexually immoral and to be drunk on sin and do whatever they want to do however they want to do it. You, you, you know that. You know that's why a, a lot of people right now, if you want to grow a church, I can tell you how to do it. You just preach a message where people don't, that, that, that redemption doesn't cost them anything. You preach a message that what God really wants is for you to be your best you, and he wants you to be happy. He wants you to be wealthy. He doesn't want you sick. Really. I'm doing a daily... Bible reading plan right now, and um, I just read the words uh, in Samuel after David had committed uh, adultery with Uriah's wife that it said that the Lord afflicted the baby. The Lord did. Not Satan. The Lord. You can read it for yourself. You want to go read it? It's there. I know this is one of those things that sometimes people act like it's not in the Bible. And you know what I noticed noticed about that, talking about? Now, look, he David gets right with God going forward. Don't misunderstand me, but remember, sin always matters. What the Lord, if you notice in the Scripture, and I'd never, I'd never caught this before, when, when that book of the Bible is being written and the words are used, the Lord afflicted the baby, do you know what else the baby is called? afflicted the baby that was in the womb of Uriah's wife. See, it's making it clear. I'm going to redeem this, and she will be David's wife at some point. And, hey, we're going to even get Solomon out of these two, okay? But right now, while I'm dealing with the sin of this, I've afflicted the baby in the womb of Uriah's wife. You took Uriah's wife, and that matters. It's not unforgivable but it matters. And so this is what we see. Well, what if you were told by a world religion, have sex with whoever you want? Get in piles. Do do, do whatever you want to do. Well, if you're lost and unregenerated, you might think, that sounds great. Uh, So so that's what we're going to see, and that's why he sees this, that that, that they're, they're drunk on the sexual immorality and these will all sexual immorality, 
has been, always will be a marker of Babylon. Always has been, always will be. Anybody looked around? Right now I'm reading about Babylon. I know it feels like I'm reading about the United States of America, but it, it, I'm reading about Babylon. And I'm not saying we're, the, we're the, going to be the new Babylon. Don't hear me saying that. I'm just saying we have markers of a Babylon in our country. Uh, so three, it says, uh, let's look at verse three. So in verse three, then something happens. He's, it says, and he carried me, that, that angel, he carried me away in the spirit. That's crucial. So he's got, he's got the Holy Spirit giving him clarity on this into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. Now, we've heard this before. So John's carried away to the, the wilderness. He sees a woman, that's the harlot, that's the false world religion, sitting on a scarlet beast. Clearly, clearly this is telling us, you know who's at the that is supporting this false world religion that it all rides on? The Antichrist. This is a world religion created by the Antichrist, and there she is sitting on that scarlet beast saying he's the foundation. She's just what's flowing out of really the Antichrist. And John has shown this, and he's shown that clearly. He says he is supporting her. Now, remember what I said earlier, and you're going to see this shift as we move through the rest of 17 to 18 over the next couple of weeks. He's supporting her. They will coexist for a while, the false church, and the false political system, but that's not going to last long, and you're going to see that. The beast will eventually completely devour the church. And, and this scarlet that you see, it always indicates, this is always synonymous with luxury, splendor, royalty. It's also associated with what? Sin. Anybody remember the scarlet letter? That's what you wore if you were an adulterer, right? So it's also associated with sin. All this applies to the false church. All this applies to the to the harlot. So, and then these names that the, they're blasphemous. What it means is this false church. This is big. Don't miss this. Because remember, the Antichrist says, "I'm a blasphemer of the only God." Okay. What this is telling you is that a false church will give you versions of God that aren't His name. Now, God has a lot of names that he has pre-approved and a lot of names that he calls himself. His favorite is 5,000 times in, in, in the scriptures, Yahweh, which is what? Lord of everything. You know what a false church will always do? They won't use Yahweh. You're your own authority. You're not under his authority. As a matter of fact, he loves you so much. He does. He does he's... he's you do think, I mean, why would God withhold that from you if that makes you happy? If he really loves you. So there'll be, there'll be, there'll be presentations of God that are blasphemous. The seven heads and the ten horns, that's, the, uh, the, that, that's letting you know how many alliances the world religion will have. That, that features all the people in power all over the world. They'll all be endorsers of the false church. So then you look in 4. Let's look at 4A first. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. Her apparel is, is here. So she's dressed what? When, when a woman dresses up, why is a woman dressing up? You, you, ever, you ever heard the, uh, uh, the old song by Reba McIntyre, Fancy? How's Fancy get her a man? She, Mama put her last money in a dress that made Fancy look good. Go out there and don't, don't see if you can't better yourself. See if you can get the attention of somebody. So what this is saying is this prostitute, this harlot, which all prostitutes and harlots do, they dress to attract attention. And the harlot of Babylon will be no different. Purple and scarlet. Royalty, prosperity, nobility, wealth, gold. Uh, it, it, it's a precious stone. We, we, got, we got pearls. What she will be, it says, is this. And look around. I'm going to say this again. Look around. Birth pangs. You know what a false church always is? 
beautiful and wealthy. Beautiful and wealthy. Extremely attractive. I got to be where everything's going on. That's the popular place. That's where everybody goes. I, I mean, when I go there, I just feel good. It makes me feel good. And, and man, they got money. Man, they got money. Have you seen all the things they're building? All the stuff they do? They're loaded. Well, if they're loaded, they must be prosperous, and that which means they must be successful. It must be God's honoring them. Well, I got to be there. Tell me about the messages. Well, inch deep, mile wide. But, man, I feel great. Hmm? Hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I watched one of their videos. Was that a TED Talk or, or was that somebody preaching out of the Bible? It sounded like a motivational life coach. Yeah, but it's great. I mean, obviously, God loves it. Look how wealthy it is. Look how beautiful it is. It, 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 there can't be anything wrong with it. Now, that's exactly what Satan hopes you'll think. And then we get into the abominations of the harlot, 4B and 5. And then it says, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes, some of your Bible say harlots, and of the earth's abominations. Gold cup, obviously, that's that's the wealth. It, it's a cup which stands for drunkenness. The cup they drink to be drunk and easily manipulated. All sorts of abominations of unclean things. Which is the reason why the Bible hates drunkenness. God hates it. And the reason why he hates it is because if you can get drunk and your mind can be altered... You've now opened yourself up to all sorts of spiritual deception and you are easily talked into consuming abominations you would have never done if you had stayed sober. I can sadly speak to that in my own life. There's a lot of things I can't fix on this side of heaven that drunkenness caused. But I'm thankful for redemption and I'm thankful for a new life. But it also, it's okay for me to give a warning that I know that this is true. So in five, why is she putting this on her forehead? Why is she telling everybody who she is? Well, they, they said this was custom, uh, a custom in the Roman Empire. I didn't know this. That in the Roman Empire, if you were going to be a prostitute, you had to identify yourself. So you had to have something on you that it, that everybody knew. Well, and and we're not that that's still carrying on. You you ever been to India? Red light district. Why is the red light on? This is where the prostitutes are. And, and and so what what is happening here is just about every time that we find ourselves being deceived. See, if we don't, if we have the Holy Spirit, we probably see that on her forehead. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're so enthralled with her beauty, her wealth, and her abominations, you didn't even notice that right there it says on her forehead who she is. Because you're, you're, you're not thinking straight. The mystery means that she's the geographical Babylon that represents the worldly resistance to God. She says, oh, I am a major player in this world resistance against God. This war against God, I'm a big player in it. And that's the mystery. I'm representing, it's like I'm wearing the Babylon logo. She's great. It says far-reaching. Her influence so great, they call her the mother of the of the prostitutes, mother of harlots. You ever had that say? So I tell you one thing, I wasn't just a tornado. It was the mother of all tornadoes. Well, you go, well, now the prostitute's one thing, but this thing is the mother of all prostitutes. All prostitutes pale in comparison to her. And the abominations of the earth, she will be the source of all worship and all idolatry. I am the source. It all flows from my false church and my false religion. And I'm here to entice you to it 
And I'm here to convince you it's the best thing you've ever experienced. And I'm hoping that you'll be grinning and smiling and you'll be perfectly happy when you burn in hell. But I sure do hope you have a good time before it comes. I, I, that's one of the things I actually remember people saying this to me. I actually had a guy say this to me one time. It was a long time ago. And praise God, he was redeemed later. And he literally told me that he was not afraid of going to hell. And he was almost excited about going to hell because he'd finally get to meet Jimi Hendrix. Th this idea that if you're a partier, who cares if you go to hell because you get to be a part of the greatest party ever. I'd have rather laugh with the sinners and cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. You are a fool. This is the harlot. This is the deception that somehow you're going to a party. The adversary and Satan and your fallen flesh, all they want you to do is to be tortured and be miserable and be in anguish forever. They know they're going down, and you know who they hate? Human beings. How dare him bring y'all in to replace us? How dare him offer y'all repentance, and he's cursed us? And we know that that, that how valuable you are to him because we know he went to the cross for you, which we hated. And the best way that we can hurt God is by killing y'all. And that's why we're here because we hate God. And he loves you. Think about that. You know, it's one thing for somebody to say they're after you. What if somebody said, but I'm going to kill your children? Which one of those hurts worse? Somebody saying they're after you or somebody saying, no, you're going with your day, but I know where your kids are and I'm going to go kill them. Well, that's the plan. That's the plan. Verse 6. You will realize how important all this is? And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. You know what else the false church really has a lust for? To be worshipped. To indulge in all sorts of abominations. But you know what the Antichrist really loves? And Satan and the demons, they have a lust for violence. They love violence. Somebody actually, and it was interesting because somebody asked me about before my redemption that they were disappointed to hear the man that I was. And I said, well, I wish you would look at that more of how wonderful redemption is, not be disappointed on how bad I was. Because away from redemption, I was a man that, I've already told you some of the things, but you know one of the things I also was? I was violent. It just, it just, flew, it just would flow from me. I loved violence. I loved to fight. I loved to scare people. I love to take things from people. I love to intimidate people. And so this is a marker of what they love. They love violence. She has killed the Old Testament prophets. She has killed the New Testament saints throughout history. False religion, listen to this, it's important, False religion is a murderer. The world has become drunk on her, and she became drunk on the blood of God's people. That's what she gets drunk on. And you see it. You see it's going on and on. It's been going on. And, G and Jesus himself in Matthew 23, 37 he, he, he knew this would be, and he was saying, I, y'all have killed the prophets, meaning you've been deceived and you've been talked into killing the prophets, okay? You have stoned those that my Father has sent you. 
the New Testament. And I have longed to actually gather you together and protect you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks. But you were unwilling. And because of that, this violence is going to continue. I was actually here to protect you from it. But you rejected the only protection that God can give you. And so she has become drunk on God's people. I think it's interesting what John does next, and we'll end here. And then we'll come back next week. Lord willing. Look what John said. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. Have you ever had that happen in your life? When somebody says, just wait till you see it. And when you see it, you know what he's saying, and, and I studied all the English words that are being used here. He's really saying, I'm shocked. I'm astonished. And you know what else he's saying? I'm frightened. It's terrifying. This is such a ghastly vision. I'm having an uncontrollable response to it. Have you ever had something that jarred you so much you couldn't control your response? You, you couldn't steady yourself. You, you couldn't say, I don't want to show my emotion right here. I don't want to show my reaction. It was so astonishing you couldn't keep from doing it. Well, that's what John says. Man, this seventh angel just showed me something. And when I saw her, I marveled greatly. And this is not a positive marvel. He's even confused about how awful this is. Because here's what he said in a nutshell. And, and, and Solomon warns his sons about this in Proverbs quite a bit. You, you'll be surprised how much Solomon warns his sons about loose women. He said, I'm telling you, they're trouble. And so what we have when you have a church, I'm using quotations, a false church, a false religion, it's an unfaithful bride, it's an unfaithful woman. She is beautiful, she is wealthy, you are drawn to her, but she ain't nothing but trouble. And in this case, it's beyond that she would be difficult to deal with. And you can't trust her and you wonder where she is. And, you know, you ever notice how many times you, you see some idiot that will be unfaithful with his wife with another woman, and then he goes with that woman and she's unfaithful again with somebody else and he's surprised? <laughs> Do you remember how you met her? Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, but anyway... This is the nutshell, and we'll end on this. Here's what John would tell us. If we were sitting here right now, said, I'm going to say, hey, John just walked in. John, good to see you. I'm gonna, can you just throw in a nutshell what we just studied? Were you listening? I did. You were there. Yeah. Let me tell you this, guys. He'd look at us. He'd say, here's what I saw. I saw a beautiful woman with deadly intent. I saw a beautiful woman with deadly intent. All that shines is not gold. And just so, so what I would caution all of us right now, this is important. If you are part of some sort of congregation, or you're watching something or listening to something, and you're redeemed. So you're redeemed, and, and that means you have the Holy Spirit. Now I'm not saying that 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 the you know the the harlot is here and the world false religion is here because it's not. But what did Jesus tell us in Matthew 24? These these birth pangs I'm showing you and preparing you for what's coming. This is what you got to be careful of in the now. Okay? Cuz I know this is that important. This is the revelation, Rick. I think I'll be raptured. Got it. But right now, you're still here. And you're still, as Peter told us in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, you're still in a fallen world that has a sin nature. Listen, just, just, just so I can wash my hands of this, okay? 
and because I love you. I can't make you do it, but I'm not going to stand before God and he say, he say, well, I told you to tell him that. You didn't tell him. Then I'll be held accountable for it, okay? If you are listening to a praise and worship song, and because you are redeemed and because you have the Holy Spirit, something doesn't sound right. Get rid of it. Even if you go, well, three quarters of the song I think is right. If there's anything in there that's trying to twist your correct view of God, get rid of it. If you're in a church and it's wealthy and all the pretty people go there and uh, and, and the presentation is unbelievable, as good as anything Hollywood could ever put out. And the first time you heard a message and you went, that doesn't sound right. Don't let the beauty and the wealth override your spiritual discernment. Get out of there. See, that's that's the point that God wants me to make today to myself and to you. Don't let God's Holy Spirit give you the discernment that he promised and you ignore it. And why would you ignore it? Because she's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. It makes me feel so good. It's got a good hook. I enjoy it. Now, if you're in a place and the theology is sound, and there's no prompting in your Holy Spirit. There's a lot of places that God has blessed that are, they have wealth, they have great facilities. There's nothing wrong with all that. That's great as long as they're using it for the right reason. That, so I'm, don't hear me saying that. I've been to a lot of really big, wealthy churches that are sold out for Jesus. And I've been in a lot of little bitty churches that are as cold as they could possibly be. But I've been in little churches that are on fire for Jesus and every size in between. And I've been to big churches that are as lost as they can be. And the people, they, they, they may have a lot of people, but they ain't got a lot of followers of Jesus. So I'm not giving you, if it has this, this, and this, it must be bad. Don't hear me saying that. What I'm saying is, don't let the wonderful things override your discernment. Now, that's what I am saying. Everybody clear? Don't go out here saying Rick said big churches are bad, because I didn't say that. What I said is, don't let all the comforts and all the presentation override bad theology. When you hear bad theology in a song or in a sermon, you got to go. Listen to the discernment. She may be beautiful, but she's got a deadly intent. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you give us that discernment that we know comes with redemption. And Lord, I pray that you make us so uncomfortable with things that are not of you, we can't stay with them. And I pray, Lord, that even today there's people either in this room and there's people all across the world that heard something from you today that said, I need to act on that. Hey, if you need some help, I'll be glad to help you. You can reach out to me, Rick, at BurgessMinistries.com. Lord, thank you for uh, the hope that we have in you. And you, Lord, help us to overcome and stand before you and hear, well done, good and faithful servant, that we never fell away from you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.